This is the Theory of Flight, read as part of the prescribed reading for 2022 for the IEB curriculum. This is Book 1, Part 2, Becky Temba. In 1988, a couple of years after the Masukus took Marcus away from the Beaufort Farm and Estate, Becky Temba Nyati drove stealthily under the cover of darkness up that same road. He had first driven up the road in the light of a day a few months earlier, and it was because of that first trip that he was making this second trip. He parked his car some distance from the compound, walked through the barren sunflower fields, and was astounded by the eerie silence of the place, where even the dogs refrained from howling at the full moon or barking at him. The life that once was here had disappeared. Becky Temba shone a torch into a disused well when something glimmered at the bottom, shocking him with its sudden unexpectedness. As he stole away from the compound, feeling both relieved and weary that he had found nothing, no one in the well, he tried to reconcile the man he now was with the man he had thought that he would be. The year was 1980. And Becky Temba, perhaps for the first time in his life, felt rooted, connected to everything and everyone around him. A son of the soil in a real, literal sense. He was something that had germinated and sprouted. Broken through the earth from this very spot, his eyes stung, his throat choked, his lungs filled with something heavy and bitter, People ran helter-skelter seeking safe spaces. Chaos, confusion, panic, uncertainty, fear, all around him. And yet here he stood unmoved, rooted, connected, certain. The tear gas would clear, and when it did, he would still be in this moment in history. He had come all this way to see Prince Charles and hopefully shake his hand. His own grandfather had shaken the hands of various members of the British royal family. King George VI, the Queen Mother, Queen Elizabeth II, the Princess Margaret. By the time his grandfather passed away, he had lost most of his memory. He had forgotten his own name, which was Cosmos Nyati. He had forgotten the name of his Christian wife and those of his two common-law wives. He had forgotten the name of his 13 children and those of his 28 grandchildren. He had even forgotten that he was a successful businessman whose enterprising spirit had seen him leave his family in the village at the age of 16 to work as a stock boy for a Mr. McKenzie at the McKenzie General Goods Store. By the time he died, Cosmo Sunyati had forgotten that at the age of 17 he had suggested to Mr. McKenzie that he open a bottle store. Although Mr. McKenzie's general goods store was the only store for kilometers, his business was failing because people seemed to prefer traveling um, goodsmen who always gave you a little something extra, a bonsella as an added bonus for patronizing their business. Since the McKenzie General Goods Store was located just outside the emission station, Mr. McKenzie doubted that a bottle store would have enough customers considering it would be within the ever-watchful purview of the missionaries. But because Mr. McKenzie was at his wit's end, a favorite phrase of his whenever he spoke of his relationship with the colony, he agreed to open a bottle store on the condition that Cosmos would manage it himself. The McKenzie Bottle Store proved so successful that Mr. McKenzie soon decided to open another one in the village and once again sent Cosmos to manage it. Because of the popularity of the two bottle stores, McKenzie became a household name and the general goods store became a successful by association. By the time he died, Cosmos and Yati had forgotten that when Mr. McKenzie had come to another wit's end, this time not with the colony but with the situation brewing in Europe, he suddenly returned to Scotland in 1938 and had been generous enough to bequeath the McKenzie General Goods Store and the two McKenzie Bottle Stores to the very man who had made them a success. In 1938, most African men would have been very happy to own three successful stores. But Cosmos Nyati was not. He grew his business to include the McKenzie line of buses and the McKenzie bioscope. 
He was what was known in the colonies as a good African, primarily Christian, mostly hardworking, generally clean and sober. And because of this, whenever there was a royal tour, he was brought forward as an example of the progress the colony had made with its African population. Which was how he came to shake the hands of King George VI, the Queen Mother, Queen Elizabeth II, and Princess Margaret. Of all the things that he had done in his 72 years, he was the proudest of the moments when he had shaken the hands of royalty. And so, as he entered the twilight of his years, he forgot all about these moments. When he passed away, he left his family with two inheritances the Mackenzie buses, and his pride in the family's connection to the British royal family. This was why, when Becky Temba made his way to the stadium to see Prince Charles receive the Union Jack and witness the flag of the newly independent country being raised in its place, he was filled with the family pride and a great deal of sadness over the sun finally setting on the empire. At the age of 18, he had enough hubris to believe in the world that he would have a private moment with Prince Charles to say, My grandfather, Cosmos Nyati, owner of the Mackenzie bus businesses, knew your grandfather and your mother. He was a good African. He shook their hands. And Prince Charles would say in turn, Cosmos Nyati, of course, my grandfather and mother talked of him often. He was indeed a good African, very enterprising for one of his kind. Then Becky Temba would tell Prince Charles that he was strongly opposed to his country ceasing to be a British colony, that he had deliberately not joined the armed struggle led by terrorists, and that he, at age 18, would was very much saddened by the fact that he and all his future children would not be British subjects. Of course, that is not how things had turned out. The Union Jack had indeed come down, been folded and handed over to the future King of England, and Becky Temba had surprised himself by feeling absolutely nothing. He was confused by this, his lack of feeling. Prince Charles had seemed ill at ease, anemic and far removed from everything that was happening around him. Whether he was just above it all or whether he was simply uninterested, Becky Temba could not tell. Instead of being a prince, he seemed to be playing at future king in his bright white military regalia. Becky Temba suspected that the shoes the, the prince was wearing were slightly too big for him. In all honesty, the prince had proved to be something of a disappointment. Just as Becky Temba was reconciling himself to an anticlimactic evening, a man in dreadlocks got on stage, raised up a fisted hand and called out, Viva! The crowd went wild and Becky Temba felt something stir within him. Something nascent, some th a beautiful beginning. For the first time, he became fully aware of the throng around him and of its elation and euphoria at finally being independent and free. He was jostled this way and that, but did not mind. This closeness, this tight togetherness was actually comforting. The dreadlocked man, eyes closed, drummed his guitar. Three women's sirens really made melodious sounds. The crowd moved as one and carried Becky Temba along. For the first time, Becky Temba felt part of something larger than himself. The man opened his eyes and looked directly at Becky Temba. Viva! the man called out again. The crowd went wild, shouting, Viva! In reply, Becky Temba found himself joining with his own Viva, even though he did not know what the word meant. Then he felt something travel through his body, a jolt of electricity that traveled from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet, grounding him, connecting him to the soil. The crowd, with Becky Temba in it, became one, moving, breathing, almost menacing force. Becky Temba could do nothing but look at the dreadlocked man, mesmerized. It was the dreadlocked man who was doing this to the people. He seemed to possess a certain power, a power that Prince Charles did not possess. 
the power to move, unite and inspire people. Later, Bekitemba would know that this man had a power called charisma. This dreadlocked man, Bekitemba was certain was going to lead him to something great. This dreadlocked man closed his eyes again. There was a flash of light. The air grew thick with smoke that stung the eyes and filled the lungs with something bitter. The crowd panicked, helter skelter. Becky Temba would not move. He felt too connected, too rooted. He waited patiently for the dreadlocked man to open his eyes again. If it so happened that he was destined to die here on this spot on in his 18th year, so be it. He would gladly die, but only after the dreadlocked man had opened his eyes again. The smoke cleared, the sting lifted his eyes. He took a deep breath. Clean air filled his lungs. The man on stage opened his eyes, looked straight at Becky Temba again. Something like a smile, a lazy smile, played on his lips. A look of respect entered his eyes. The dreadlocked man's band and his melodious backing singers returned to the stage. It was only then that Becky Temba realized that everyone else had run away as soon as the smoke had filled the air. Now I know who is the real revolutionary, the dreadlocked man said, still looking directly at him. Becky Temba felt as though he had been anointed. For the rest of his life, he would feel a strong connection with that man. He would speak of his encounter with the dreadlocked man with just as much pride as his grandfather had had in speaking of shaking the hands of British royalty. Becky Temba was known to find the perfect moment, whatever the occasion, to stand up in a gathering and regale them with the story of how Bob Marley had looked at him through the smoke of a tear gas filled stadium and told him that he was a real revolutionary. That encounter changed him. It had filled him with pride in his country and in his blackness that he had never had before. He wrote of this life-changing encounter as a letter to the editor for the local state-run newspaper. The letter was printed and a few days later he received a call from the man himself, praising his writing and offering him a scholarship to study journalism at the local state-run university. Becky Temba, the anointed one, happily took up the offer. Soon after graduating, he went to work for one of the local state-run newspapers, his pride in his country making him a great mouthpiece for the state. He was a nationalist. He was a patriot. He was a revolutionary. He firmly believed that he lived in the country that Bob Marley had sung so proudly and so passionately about. And now he wrote about his country with equal pride and passion. Truth be told, Becky Temba felt the privilege of being so singled out by the man himself. It was not lost on him that his connection to the man himself accorded him respect among his peers and helped him garner a reputation. If he had felt any guilt over being so cherry-picked, he was able to do away with it by convincing himself that he was the man that this country needed at this particular moment. As a young man, it had embarrassed him to admit that he had been so colonized that he had not once considered joining the liberation struggle because, like his grandfather and father before him, he had so loved being a British subject. But he was sober enough now to reflect on that period of his life objectively. His country had not needed him then. Perhaps he would have been killed. And what good would he, that have been for the country? His country needed him now. He could write the kinds of stories that would help build the nation. He would be the one to change his country from a racist, divided country into a multiracial, unified country. The man himself told Becky Temba that because the country was still young and working out its differences, and because civil wars often had repercussions, conflict was inevitable. However, the country had an image to portray and protect, and Western countries were waiting for it to fail. It was Becky Temba's job to ensure that the West did not receive any ammunition with which to destroy the country's image. Becky Temba understood why the West should not be given reason to discredit or malign the country 
but he also believed that the country should be given a chance to examine itself because that was the only way it could understand itself fully, make necessary changes and create an equal society. That was the real revolution as far as Becky Temba was concerned. The creation of an equal, discrimination-free, all-inclusive society. To this end, he wrote award-winning article on a woman's right to wear trousers, on the dignity of the disabled, on the plight of farm workers, on the history of the colored people, on the rich multicultural heritage of the Khoisan, on why women deserved equal pay, on the importance of commercial farming to the national economy. Often, the man himself would call Becky Temba and praise him on an article he had written, always making sure to quote a particular paragraph, turn of phrase or scintillating sentence. Becky Temba always felt honored and humbled by such attention and strove to write and do even better. As a reporter, he prided himself on his objectivity, his ability to present all sides of the story, and his providing his fellow citizens with information that helped them better understand their country and each other. His articles often led to very engaged exchanges of ideas and opinions in the letter to the editor section. The man himself informed Becky Temba that he was thinking of shaking things up at one of the local state-run newspapers, which still had too many white journalists and therefore did not reflect the independence of the majority. Would Becky Temba Nyati like to be the new head of the investigative reporting? Becky Temba had just turned 25 and felt old enough for such a responsibility. He took the promotion. When someone from a car assembly plant called him to tell him that state ministers were illegally reselling cars that they had received for free as part of their payment packages, one had resold as many as 11 cars, Becky Temba thought it a good story to highlight corruption and make people think about wh why they elected officials and what kind of character an elected official should have. He could already see the conversation that would play out in the letter to the editor section. He wrote the piece, but it was not printed. He spoke to the editor-in-chief, who told him that from now on he could only report on things that the man himself told him to. The editor-in-chief laughed at the confusion on Becky Temba's face. Hey, you're green, he said. The man himself also has illegally resold several cars, and you actually thought we would be able to run the story. The time will come for such a story, trust me. But for now, this is our free press. Becky Temba called the man himself and was told he was out of the office. He did so five times before he realized that the man himself was deliberately avoiding him. He went to work the following day, awaiting the call from the man himself that would let him know that he could write on. The call never came. He reported to work for almost three months, receiving a paycheck every fortnight. But the man himself did not call. Becky Temba sat at his desk with nothing to do and watched as his colleagues bustled about. He noticed things, the wear and tear of the furniture, the cobwebs in the corners, the grey grime creeping up the windows, the smell of boiled cabbage that wafted up from the company cafeteria and remained trapped in the building for the first time. He knew every chip and chink in the furniture, how many cobwebs there were, what progress the grey grime had made, and where the boiled cabbage smelled the strongest, and where it was overcome by the smell of sun-baked urine that rose up from the alley behind the building. He realized how much he compromised himself through this association with the man himself. His colleagues would not talk to him, would not look him in the eye. He felt certain that they laughed at him behind his back for thinking that he had curried the favor of the man himself. He thought of seeking employment at another newspaper, but all newspapers were state-run and he was now wise enough to know that it would be a futile exercise. Perhaps if he had not received a paycheck every two weeks, he would have felt better, but he did. And he knew that the paycheck for the services rendered was the man himself's way of communicating something. Power. That was when he heard the rumor. 
People in a particular region of the country were systematically being disappeared by the state. Becky Temba refused to believe it. Even when the rumors became more specific, it was a particular ethnic group in the, this particular region of the country which was systematically being disappeared by the state. Becky Temba was steadfast in his refusal to believe the rumors. And then news arrived that his cousin, someone he remembered playing with as a boy, who, unlike Becky Temba, had decided to cross the Zambezi River to become a freedom fighter, had been disappeared. He knew that the story of his cousin's disappearance would be forever uninvestigated, unwritten and unsolved. Something stung in his eyes and filled his lungs with bitterness. He blinked his eyes, swallowed hard and decided to ignore it. By the time the man himself called Becky Temba and gave him a direct assignment, he had learned his lesson well. The man himself told him that there was a crazy man on the Beaufort Farm and Estate who believed he was capable of flight and was cultivating a race of angels. The followers who believed that they, would, they too were capable of flight. The man was building a giant pair of silver wings so that he could fly to the woman he so that he could fly the woman he loved to Nashville, Tennessee. The man's followers touched the wings, prayed to the wings, kept watch over the wings, made offerings to the wings, all in hopes of one day having wings of their own. The man himself said that this would be the perfect story with which to amuse the masses during a difficult time. For Becky Temba, the story of a crazy man and his cult was obviously one worth telling, not because it was amusing, but because it was about the audacity to believe. He could already see the letter to the editor section abuzz with excitement. This was how he was going to redeem his fall from grace. There was only one problem. Becky Temba did not believe in love, at least not in romantic love. He understood the love one had for one's parents and for one's country, but that sort of love was born of respect and gratitude. It was a sort of giving back. There was a reason for that kind of love. It was only natural to love the things that had given you life, a sense of place, a feeling of belonging, a connection to the things beyond yourself. You could not exist without these things, and so of course you loved them. It was a selfish love a love of self-preservation. Selfish love was understandable, reasonable. But romantic love had no reason. Becky Temba had read somewhere that it was merely an invention, something that could preoccupy people, a yearning that could never be fulfilled, something that would make one's life a quest rather than a series of unrelated, mostly boring events. And so Becky Temba did not quite believe that this man building a pair of giant silver wings was doing it for love. Love of a woman. Becky Temba suspected that there was another more interesting, more real, more reasonable, and that in itself was a story enough for him. Intrigued, Becky Temba made his way to the Beaufort Farm and Estate. He drove up a dusty road surrounded by a sea of sunflowers. Out of the sunflowers came a flash of colourful light that made Becky Temba bring his car to an abrupt stop. In the middle of nowhere, anything was possible. He waited for the dust to settle before making his next move. The dust cleared and there was a girl standing in front of the car. Left arm akimbo, a teddy bear dangling from her right, and a rag doll firmly secured on her back. Her face was knotted in a frown that was more curious than unfriendly. She was mere inches from the car. Becky Temba saw her mouth move but could not hear her. He switched off the engine and rolled down his window. Who are you coming to take away? She asked, deliberately not coming any closer. What an odd question. Who are you coming to take away? She repeated, still standing her ground. No one? He said, flashing his most charming smile. She looked unconvinced. Is this the place, Beaufort Farm and Estate, where the man is building an aeroplane? He asked. Her frown became unfriendly. I'm a reporter. I would like to do a story on this man. Why a story? She asked. How was he supposed to respond to that? 
Why a story? What else but a story? All he did was look for stories. It had never occurred to him to do anything else, to look for something else. Well, I think this story is of interest. I think people will be inspired by the story. Why inspired? She asked. Another question that he could not respond to. Did she even understand what it meant to be inspired? She was probably asking questions simply to ask questions. The way most children did. Who are you looking to inspire? She asked. Or maybe not. Maybe she understood the conversation that they were having better than he did. A lot of people, many people don't believe that we can fly. Many people need to believe that we can fly. He waited for her next question, but none came. Instead, just as quickly as she had appeared, as a flash from the sunflowers, she disappeared, as a flash back into the sunflowers. Becky Temba sat in his car, not sure what to do next. A moment later, he was not quite sure if a girl had really been standing in front of his car. He had been driving for hours and his mind had probably played a trick on him. She had been such a bright and sprightly thing. There had definitely been something otherworldly about her. Becky Temba laughed at himself. What was he thinking? He was a man of reason. Of course the girl did exist. Should he carry up on the dirt road or should he turn around? As he was trying to decide, he saw them. A group of people coming down the dusty road, led by the girl. She did exist. Becky Temba got out of the car, not quite sure if he was welcomed or not. He says he's not here to take anyone away, the girl announced before he could say anything. He says he's here to tell the story of the man building the wings. She continued with authority. He says the story will inspire people. He says people don't believe that we are capable of flight, she said, and waited for whatever would happen next. An impossibly tall man came forward. I believe I am the man you are looking for, he said humbly. Becky Temba doubted it. The man was painfully white. He is my father, the girl said, her chest puffing out with unmistakable pride. She looked at the painfully white man with reverence. All those who looked at the man looked at him with reverence. Soon, Becky Temba understood the source of their pride. Just looking at the man, Becky Temba could tell there was something different about him, something beyond the color of his skin. He possessed that certain something that Becky Temba had witnessed in the dreadlocked man, power. But not just any power, power of a special kind, the power to move, inspire and unite people. Charisma. The man told Becky Temba how he had come up with his theory of flight on September 3rd, 1978, as he watched elephants swim across the Zambezi River. What had made the first elephant cross was that it could see the other bank of the river. The elephant would not have swum into the ocean. Of this, the man was certain. What made the other elephants follow was the successful passage of the first. The man wanted people to know that they were capable of flight, and at first he had erroneously thought they would realize this if he taught them how to build aeroplanes. After watching the elephants, he understood that what was needed was merely his own belief in flight. If people saw him build a giant pair of silver wings, then they too would believe that they could fly.